Julian is a fucking vampire. He is fucking immortal. Tell me otherwise. back to my channel. Another, another book video. Another what I read in lockdown. There really shouldn't be two of these on my channel now, but that's how the UK government has handled coronavirus. How are you guys doing where you are? So I read some more books because I went home for Christmas and then I just didn't come back. That was really fun. It's March now and I have class again, so it's nice to be back in London. It's nice. I bought well, I bought them and then I read them, um, which has basically been the theme um, for the last year, isn't it? I've actually read the things that I bought almost immediately. And I've been heavily, heavily influenced by you lot. You all say that I influence what you read. You're all out here influencing what I read. You're sliding into my DMs with recommendations. You're in my comments. You're in my Twitter mentions. You're in my messages on Goodreads. I didn't even know you could do that. I was like, oh, hello. So you're just as bad as I am. This is a group effort, all right? So I read things. There are also things I have attempted to read and it's not going very well. So I felt like I should mention that. I should mention that as well. I'm gonna start with the things that I did end up reading over Christmas. They then got included in my everything I read in 2020 video so I won't speak about them much but let's just let's just blitz through them and then then I'll then I'll talk about talk about the ones that I know you really want to hear my my opinion on because you told me to read it. Let's get started. So is this an Emma book video without Murakami? No. I spoke about this ad nauseum in my Christmas vlog. It's linked up there for you if you want to go watch that if you want some like nos festive nostalgia. Festive hasn't been a thing in the last 365 days, has it? Also, can we just discuss the fact that it's March? It's March. I still haven't processed last March. It is March again. It is the last year, the last year. This is another one of Murakami's books that are not magical realism. I have, I recently bought Kafka on the Shore which I'm excited to read, but it's long and it's scary and the font is small. So I read this instead. This is again one of those love stories. And again, it does come from a little bit of a misogynistic viewpoint in terms of, I'm a man and the world revolves around me. Women only live for me. And women, I can destroy women emotionally with my power of being a man. When you read Murakami, I think you do need to keep that in mind. And the thing is, I'm never gonna tell you not to read something. I read Saad for God's sakes. It's interesting to just see that like male viewpoint where a lot of men would read it and go, there's nothing wrong with this book. And I'm like, oh honey, oh honey, no. So it's just interesting to see like a masculine mindset that is a little bit more like trying to be empathetic, but I think it almost manifests in that kind of like pick me behavior. You know, where they're like, I'm a good guy. I'm the good guy. Why, why are you dating assholes? You should date me instead. I'm like, no. Uh, you were just as much as an asshole as every other man. So I just don't think Murakami's male protagonists have the level of self-awareness that they ought to. And then if you read a lot of his stuff, especially as a guy, I can imagine that you just internalize it and you're like, oh, no, no, this is why. And I've said this a million times. You should read books by people that are not like you. If you're a man, Look at your bookshelf. Really think about when the last time you read a book written by a woman. And gender is dumb, it's a construct, but still it influences every single thing about who we are because it's like imposing us from birth. So go ahead and see how the other half live. This is an interesting take on how the other half live. It is a love story and sort of very nostalgic and that's massively Murakami. Very much about like missed opportunities and possible lost loves and those what ifs that sometimes you just, they're kind of cruel to try and answer even. Um, and it hurts to read and you're like, ow. Because we all have these people, I think, especially when you are a little bit older, that you're just like, wow, what would have happened if you and I had done things a little bit differently? What would have happened if you and I hadn't fallen out of touch? It's that kind of intertwining over long periods of time, in that case, decades, because he's already in his like mid thirties and he already has kids and he's married. So it's kind of like, ooh, what could this other life have been like? Um, so that in itself, like that kind of like midlife crisis almost is like, it's just very interesting to just read about because it's something that I just don't, 
I don't know, it's a different kind of viewpoint that I don't have access to, so I just recommend you read people who are different to you. But read Murakami with a grain of salt, especially. I'm not even gonna go if you're a woman, but just especially if you're a guy. I have a really mm, better in depth thing of it in that video though. Next thing that I read. I read The Alchemist, you guys. I'm really sorry. I've said that I've already apologized for this, but I think it was awful. I have strong opinions on this. I give it a one on Goodreads. I never give anything a one on Goodreads. I just thought it was bad. I just thought it was really bad. And I get it, it's meant to be about following your dreams, but that's kind of juvenile advice? I think so. I found it really contrived. It's like it's 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 like he thinks he's really doing something. It's like he thinks he's really writing something revolutionary. But if you have read anything, if you have read anything that's older, if you have read any philosophy, this is almost like redundant because you're like, well, I you read any philosophy and this is like basics 101. I can I've already said this, but I know that if you've never read any kind of philosophy or moral, moralizing discussions on the meaning of life and whatnot, this might be an interesting thing. If I'd have read this when I was 13, 14, I think I would have got a lot out of it. Reading as an adult, reading also as a well-read adult. And also, I had so many Brazilians in my DMs being like, he's shit! And I'm like, I know. As far as Brazilian writers go, there are a lot better out there. Here are some suggestions. Machado de Assis is somebody that I've studied who has come up a lot. He's really good. Read his stuff. If you want to read Brazilians, there is so much like interesting literature that they have and like, um, you guys enjoy guys of like magical realism writers as well. It's a very like South, South, I was about to say South African, South American genre. This just wasn't it. It is the story of a shepherd boy from the Spanish province of Andalusia who dreams of travelling the world in search of a treasure as desirable as any ever found. So what's the idea that you can turn your dreams into things? That's the alchemy if you follow your dreams. So he goes to the pyramids because he had a dream or whatever about this treasure and he gets to the pyramids and once he gets there it'll be revealed to him and then oh it's so stupid that the treasure was buried where he started his journey and it's like I don't understand what he was supposed to learn over the entire journey. So it just completely, it just feels so redundant and just stupid. And I'm like, this is dumb. Maybe I'm massively missing the point, but I feel like I couldn't even find the point because I found it so like, stupid. That's my honest opinion on it. Lots of people love this book. If you do, I'm sorry, it's not judgment on you. I just thought it was bad. If so, if you guys like it, can you let me know why? Because I feel like maybe I'm missing something. This was just not my cup of tea. I mean, I tried. I wouldn't have picked it up on my own accord. I just didn't think it was good at all. I thought like it was a waste of time. <laughs> sorry. Luckily, it's easy to read. I read it quickly. This is a bit boring as well, isn't it? You're just like waiting for something to happen, but it never really does. And then when you get to the end of it, you're kind of like, what was the point of that? Eh. His books have had a life enhancing impact on millions of people. There's so much better stuff to read though, God. I know you all want a Philosophy 101. I will provide you with a Philosophy 101 because do not start with something like that. It's stupid, genuinely. God, I found it so contrived. This stupid derivative didn't really do anything. I read Richard Rorgan's Watermelon Sugar. <sighs> yes, okay, I read it because of Harry Styles, obviously. That shouldn't be a shock to you at this point. You should have you seen what I've done to the bottom of my laptop. Where's my laptop? It's not in here. You should see what I've done to the bottom of my laptop. This was interesting. It's like sort of 1960s y counter culture sort of thing, and it doesn't explain itself. This book never explains itself. Idaf is a place where the sun shines a different colour every day, where people travel to the length of their dreams. Rejecting the violence and hate of the old gang at the Forgotten Works, they lead gentle lives in watermelon sugar. In this book, Richard Brotigan discovers and expresses the mood of a counterculture generation. This book doesn't explain itself, and like, because there's a lot about 
tigers and how the tigers destroyed the population and then like they burnt them all to death and how everything is made out of watermelon sugar and trout oil and how the sun shines a different colour every day. You want to know what he was on when he wrote this? Because this just kind of feels like some sort of LSD trip. If you've ever seen Dazed and Confused, not Dazed and Confused, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, I always mix those two up. This kind of gives me like those vibes, just because it's all taken very matter of fact, like no matter what like they're experiencing seeing, they just don't, that's just their reality. Like that is their given reality and they accept that, um, which I think is maybe the way, well, that's kind of the way that I ended up reading this. Um, I did not think I was going to like this. I was reading it like, alright, I'm only reading it because I like Harry Styles. This better be decent. And it actually was. Again, not something I would have picked up naturally, but I really enjoyed it. And also, it's short. And the chapters are sometimes a page long. So as your little resident dyslexic, I'm like, ooh, I can do this. Then again, it took me like a week to read it. Because there are some books, right, that I'll like sit down and because it's like maybe the book is 600 pages long, well, it's what, this is what I did with The Secret History, I can like commit to reading 80 pages in a day um, and then be like, oh, amazing. Even though I could have technically read this in like a day. I didn't because I knew that I could. So then I didn't, which is very counterintuitive and I can't explain to you very well. You should watch my dyslexia and reading video if you're curious as to why my brain is the way it is. I, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if this book was empathetic, but it was very like trying that. And it's kind of like a candid, not anti-realism. Oh, there's words that I want to explain the thing. It's like, well, it's completely the opposite of realism, obviously, in terms of how the world is constructed. So kind of, kind of fantasy, but it's like candid as in the fact that the book itself completely accepts that the reality they are in is their given reality. It doesn't try and question it, it doesn't try and explain it. Um, it also doesn't do any world building. I've said this before, like Murakami world builds. Um, this, absolutely nothing in there. Everything that you're given about the description of the place, you're almost like, oh, a clue, because you're not given the chance to put anything together very much. And it's all rather confusing but in a way that you learn that you just kind of have to accept that and that is the way that the world is and that you can't always expect to be given an answer to what you want or an explanation and sometimes you just have to get on with it otherwise you're not going to get anywhere. That's how I read Watermelon Sugar. I was pleasantly surprised by it. It's weird. It's weird and it's strange and it's out there but it's short and it's fun so I don't, you have nothing to lose by reading this. Um, it's dyslexia friendly for anyone's wondering, the vintage editions pretty much always are. Um, he feels in a really weird way akin to Calvino. Um, I can't, where is he so I can't fully explain why. But it's very just chilled out. And it's quite relaxed even when there are like bad things going on. I surprised myself by how much I like this actually. I do rate it. I rate it a lot. Next up, okay next up, we'll just talk about this one before I forget about it. Somebody mentioned this in a live stream of mine. Um, it's Catch and Kill by Ronan Farrow. So Ronan Farrow is the journalist who finally got the big story out on Weinstein and his serial um, raping and abusing of women in the film industry. Which had been a known thing for decades. They knew that he was doing this for a very long time and they had such a hard time proving it and a lot of like journalists really struggled to expose it, a lot of people got close. But Faro was one of the ones, well he was the one that actually got it out. It was meant to initially, I didn't know this, it was initially, the story was initially meant to go out via NBC but then because of all the like connections that everyone has with each other, they're all predators protecting one another because if one goes down the entire thing collapses. He ended up taking his story to the New Yorker, which I didn't know. Um, and I, I read that when that came out at the time as well. Shockwaves of that have been immense and like very fucking long overdue. So it's interesting to just read the story behind the story. And when I was reading it, obviously my comparison point with this kind of um, content, should we say, um, was the Epstein documentary that I watched, um, yeah, a year ago now, over the, over the first lockdown. Because you're dealing with something that if you don't do it in the right way, obviously you would be exploiting the pain and suffering of victims for your own gain, um, which is a very like area because like, 
your stories deserve to be told, how do you tell them in a sensitive, measured, just responsible more than anything way. Um, and I think this does do a good job. There is another book that I think somebody recommended that a couple of women wrote. And I'll see if I can find that comment for you if it's on screen. If I can't remember it, please let me know down below. Um, but this was just an interesting perspective. And so the concept of catch and kill, it's so slimy. Um, so like a news outlet, whatever, they will buy the rights to a story and then they ax it, which means that legally nobody can print the story again, unless for like various like legal reasons and stuff that you can actually say it, but it's like in the public interest. I think that's also the way that like, because a lot of these women are basically harassed, abused, and then they're given a payout and made to sign an NDA. An NDA is a non-disclosure agreement. And if you violate it, you I think you're like liable for the sum that you were given. But you can't like break an NDA if it's in like public interest. Um, and if it is, about like a crime. At least that's to my understanding because he never fully explains that. That's one thing that's slightly like, how did you, there were lots of NDAs everywhere. How did you get away with that? But it's scary that the power that some individuals can hold and then it does become a conspiracy, right? A lot of these predators are all protecting one another. And yeah, it kicks out a movement and just more that mentality, yeah, that it's safety in numbers. And the fact that pointing very blatantly out that people do not believe women when they come forward to say xyz has happened to me the fact that we live still very much in a victim blaming culture why did you go up to his hotel room then why did you do this why did you do that and also a lack of awareness about what sexual coercion is i only ended up knowing what it was because i was doing some research on something um that i mentioned in a video like as a grown-ass adult woman how did i not know what sexual coercion was and then also reading that and going oh wait <laughs> oh if anyone, and obviously not just women, if anybody comes forward and is like, hey, this happened to me, believe them. Things like, for example, rape is reported falsely the same rate as any other crime. It's not something that is like over-reported as false. People don't just accuse other people of these crimes, like ruin their lives. Like that is the fact that that's what some men believe is genuinely nauseating. It's like, oh, you're worried that your life is going to be ruined by an accusation imagine that actually your life being ruined by that actually happening to you you coming forward saying it and then nobody believes you or people say that it was your own fault and also in these things where men are like oh you know i'm scared to do anything with a colleague whatever because i'm gonna get accused so i'm gonna get me too if you're not a bad person and if you're not doing slimy, creepy things to women, you have nothing to worry about. When guys speak like that, it's like the biggest red flag ever. If you're a decent person, you have nothing to worry about. All you need to do is show women the most basic, common decency to not be fucking weird, creepy, or abusive. It's really not that hard. I'm gonna get me to shut up. So I thought this was good, and it put a lot of like, that thinking, obviously and that thinking and a lot of the things that I've experienced as a woman just day to day um you just put that a little bit more into a different kind of perspective in terms of like in an industry and especially this is about the film industry so this does freak me out this helps so I feel like I know a little bit more than maybe I did before but this basically goes for anything and I've said this before anytime you have any kind of social structure particularly obviously corporate where it can be very hierarchical and film is very hierarchical. Religion is the same. Anytime you have a power structure, you have the possibility for abuse. Every time. And some people take advantage of that because they feel like they're untouchable. Hopefully this has proved to a lot of people that they are not untouchable. And that's your Prince Andrew for some fucking reason. It's well written and there are things but like it is Enjoyable isn't the right word, maybe, but it's not the hardest thing in the world to read. Also, it's journalism. I read it 500 pages long and I read it in like four days, which for me, Little Disney's Nugget, is impressive. I was very impressed with myself. See, what you read makes a difference, but that is not one that you should be just, it's really easy. It's a quick read. And also you can't put it down because you're just there like, what the fuck? But there we are. Next, these are the things that I don't know you're most excited about. We'll talk about this one first. I read Normal People. It was fine. 
it was fine. It was fine. I know that loads of people really enjoyed it. I think it's nice as a contemporary piece because it came out like what a year ago, two years ago. I haven't seen the TV show yet. I think I think that's that was it. It was fine. The class commentary in it is probably the most interesting thing about it. Colin and Marianne grew up in the same small town in the west of Ireland, but the similarities end there. In school, Connell is popular and well-liked, while Marianne is a loner. But when the two strike up a conversation, awkward but electrifying, something life-changing begins. As far as like a boy meets girl kind of thing, it's not, it's not revolutionary. It's the whole like, two people who over a very long time intertwine over and over again to know which one is better or it's not here, got that. No, it is here. No, it isn't here. I thought I brought it. I think one day does the whole intertwining thing significantly better than this one does. This one is also done over a shorter amount of time. It's from when they're like 16 to when they're like early 20s. Um, they're like finishing their degrees and stuff, which is obviously just the time period that I've just finished covering. Um, I'm currently doing my MA. So I'm just like, I've just, I've just lived this. So if you're a little bit younger than me, I think you can really probably enjoy this more because it's like, you're so, it's so much more your immediate reality. Like most of you are, my age or a little bit older, we've already had these people that we've come across and keep coming across time and time again and just somehow you just, you never fully unravel from one another, you just always somehow keep coming back to each other and like, you're just like, why though? Thematically with that kind of like ebbing and flowing of how two people continue to intersect over such a long period of time, it's beautiful. And it's nice and I think there's something comforting in it because maybe it speaks to when we're not quite ready to let somebody go and that this is kind of always what we hope happens, right? We always hope that in one way or another you can stay friends or you can keep coming across each other and almost like the universe is once again maybe giving you a chance to see if this is going to work. Maybe to an extent with the story that's kind of the point, right? Connell and Marianne are given so many chances, not just to have like a romantic relationship, but more just to have the best relationship between the two. And I don't think it always needs to be romantic. I almost think that their friendship is better. You have that person that you just sort of need because they're just never going to be the same as your other friends, especially when that person is somebody that you like, you've slept with, continued to sleep with, especially if you're like friends before, then like shit happens. Like you, no matter what you do, you're never just going to be friends it's always gonna be something different and you can deny it all you like, but <laughs> to have like ever like a legit friends with benefits, for example, is very hard because you are mixing up such like, if hopefully for sex is good, some kind of like intimate passion kind of thing with then just being platonic. And I think that can, I'm sure I don't need to say this, you guys would get so fucking messy. So I think with this was always, love is never ruled out. <laughs> they kind of get there, but in a way they almost never do. And that's why, especially with the ending, maybe that's when finally they're like, was that like the last test of their strength or their desire? And again, it's interesting how this comes down class lines, right? With the ending of the book, Connell is offered a place to study in New York. And again, that's one of these things that, because of his like social class position, it's, it would already be a big deal, but it's like an exceptional deal. And they both just know that he would be ludicrous to turn it down. He'd be ludicrous to turn it down anyway, but just almost from, it feels wrong to say like how far he's come, if that makes sense. But we do link education and like higher education in terms of like social mobility. Maybe then it's showing that all oh, their different classes in the end always gonna be at odds with each other. I don't know. I think this book was, it was fine. But I think if you're gonna read it for something, read it for the class commentary. It's interesting into a lot of ways. It's like a lot of small things that kind of make you go, oh, I didn't even think of that. But as far as like two people intersecting and intertwining and never fully unraveling, one day is still a superior book for that. I cried so much. I didn't cry at the end of this. I cried so much at the end of one day, so much. Especially because it's over such a longer time. And oh, there's so much frustration in that book. Just pain and like, oh God, it's so, it's really good. Yeah, it almost is perfectly the younger version of that because in, one day, they're called Dexter and Emma, they meet in university and they, we end, we leave these guys in uni. So yeah, I guess this is almost like that's the continuation of this one, um, if you want to look at it like that. Um, it'd be an interesting thing to read together. But yeah, I say read it for the class commentary. 
rather than the intertwining. Obviously because this is so current for a lot of like the little things that do just hit home. Just how you are with that other person and where you just... No matter what you do and how hard you try, somehow you always end up such a mess. We should have let this end really badly and then we'd maybe all learn a lesson because yes, this is a fantasy and that's why I'm happy that it ends the way it does because if they ended up together it would basically be telling us that it doesn't matter how much you like almost kind of like fall in and out of each other um, you can take that as literally as you like but you always have a chance in the end which you don't because life. Okay, the next thing that I read I read Donna Tartt's The Secret History and it's fucking great. Oh my god, my mother messaged me the other day and she was like, Emma, what was that um, Academia Noir thing that you read? I was like, Academia Noir? What the fuck is, what the fuck is Academia Noir? She was like, the, the academic murder. I'm like, what the fuck is an academic murder? And I was like, oh, she means dark academia. This is just like the the Dark Academia book, isn't it? If you have any more Dark Academia books, tell me because I want them. If you want some movie recommendations, watch Dead Poet Society, watch Maurice. Um, those are good Dark Academia things. This is about a group of college students in an elite New England school. It felt a lot like reading about boarding. Because if, if you're if you're really new here, hi, I went I went to boarding school. So for me, just sort of seeing that it like captures that like essence again. Um, but then when you're a little bit older and you can like drink and fuck around a lot more. And obviously again, having been to schools like that, the way that literature is prized, the way that classics is prized, um, which is part of my thing for like my agenda for like trying to demystify classics a little bit because it's not a pretentious thing and it shouldn't be gate kept by a bunch of posh wankers because that's stupid. You should all get to enjoy these things. This was so enjoyable. It's so all-encompassing and it's so enveloping and it just pulls you in so tight and Tart grabs your hand and she's like come on and you're like Ugh! but she doesn't let go flat 600 pages you're like oh no now we need to, now we just need to keep reading it five more minutes and then you've read for with a couple more hours and you're like whoops whoops i really didn't want to leave this and i really kind of want to read it again which, this is a 600 page book. My dyslexic ass never rereads anything. And I'm already gutted that I'm never gonna have the joy of like reading this for the first time. So many of you told me to read it. So many of you told me to read it and you were so right. Especially cause yeah, obviously I read myself into this. I'm like, this is me. This is me. Or it's all just on some level who you want to be because of the way we've socially been taught to revere it almost our way in is with Richard and like his outside of perspective and sometimes we can kind of tag along in his imposter syndrome because maybe to an extent we know that that's how we would feel if we were in those situations he was in. There was a body in the first sentence but in every other aspect it's a slow burn because you're spending your time trying to put the it's that like chrono, chrono, that chronology that you're missing and you're just trying to figure out how it works and she intercuts those moments where you get those bits of truth about what they did, sort of with what is happening. Um, so you find yourself sort of like, you get to, like you know, you know you know this has happened the entire time. You know they've murdered him the entire time. You're just never told how. So you're spending your entire time trying to pick up on the little things. Like, oh, is this a red herring? Oh, is this, oh, is this, oh, is this? Just try and finally build up that most clear, vivid and detailed picture. You know pretty damn quickly that they, you know, booted him into the ravine. But you never, you just never see it happen. You know it happens, but you never see it happen. And that is what keeps you so in it. And then also just waiting for them to get caught. And then the way <laughs> that their relationships then with each other just disintegrates. Like also, how is it that they're like, we'll kill him? It's like how they managed to like talk themselves into how this is the most reasonable and rational course of action. And there's just something, cause, you, cause you're reading it and you're like, yeah, yeah, and you've almost become brainwashed yourself. And like, I think this is why quite a few people have said, and I actually agree with this massively, this is the worst book hangover I've ever had. That's a thing, I didn't even know that was a thing. This is the worst book hangover I've ever had. I couldn't read anything for just like two weeks. I was like, no, you just, it ends and you're still processing it because you almost get brainwashed 
You almost let Henry brainwash you. You almost let the twins brainwash you. You almost let Richard convince you that this is the most reasonable course of action. By the way, I think Julian's a vampire. <laughs> I don't think anything of his character makes sense. This is the only thing that's really frustrating me actually, is because Julian is like built up in such a way but nothing ever actually comes of him. Do you not feel that way? I'm like, Julian is a fucking vampire. He is fucking immortal. Tell me otherwise. I will not accept things otherwise. He is your Dorian Gray. Like that is absolutely what Julian is. Like it doesn't make any sense otherwise. And this is one of the occasions where the fact that we don't get any answers, like in Watermelon Sugar, to not get any answers, fine, 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 cool, cool. It's not okay in this. I am now still dead curious about Julian. We got no answers, we got no closure, shall we say. Watermelon Sugar works because it was never gonna give you closure and you knew that from the beginning. This is like, maybe I'll give you closure, maybe I won't. And then she chooses not to and it's like, for fuck's sake. What I'm also curious about is how this has never been turned into a movie. There is no film of this that exists. There's no film of this that exists. But why isn't there a film that exists of it? It's a really, then I get really excited about like, okay, but then what kind of books work well when they're adapted and what don't? There are a lot of films that were books, but like that you didn't, you've never read the book because the book is shit, but it still made a really good movie. Um, which then, this blows my mind because like, you know that it's a good, you know that it's a good book. You know it's a great story. Why wouldn't it make a great movie? Why hasn't it been done? I wonder, I really, really wonder. It's just how it really all sort of, Slowly, well, it just how the ending of it between each other, uh, between the group of them, just sort of disintegrates, like watching that slowly happen. And sort of like with each little inch, even though it's a tiny little, you know they can never come back from it. Sort of seeing that deterioration is so like frustrating and like, oh, shit, oh, why no? Um, I'm not sure about the twin cest bit. Do you not think that was almost too much of like a sensationalist kind of thing? Then again, obviously, reading it, I've watched Game of Thrones. Twin Cess is like, not that, I don't want to be like, oh, you don't ban eyelash, but you're like, you've been done. But obviously when she wrote this, that hadn't been done. Well, George R. R. Martin had done it, but obviously TV show made it very, very popular. So I'm wondering about that. It's always interesting to like think about like how over time in different cultures and whatever things are like perceived and things are like the reading experience that we have just because our cultural context and frameworks are different um, and social ones are different. I really wonder if Henry had to die. I do. I don't, I just don't think it was necessary. I just don't think Camilla and Henry needed a relationship and I don't think the twin cess thing needed to happen and it just, but then you also wonder like how could it have ended any other way? I think also like the commentary on wealth, again, in this, not in no way similar to um, normal people, really not at all similar, but it's that very, Richard gives you a little bit of imposter syndrome. He doesn't try that hard. He tries hard enough, but he doesn't try that hard. And I guess maybe because we all know that Bunny has even less money, which is just kind of funny. That rhymes. But I was having a discussion with a friend about this recently, it's like, the people who, like they have money and they are by all definitions rich, but they're not maybe as rich as they think they are, or rather they're not as rich as they want to be. And generally that gives them a lot of like insecurities about money, which then generally means they end up being the people who buy the things with logos on them. And they buy the things to just like assert that they belong to a certain group, socially and financially because they're insecure that they belong there in the first place. It's literally the whole nouveau riche thing, isn't it? God, what's the, is it like a phrase? Like, oh. New money screams, old money whispers. It's something like that. Um, and I've seen so many of these like on Pinterest, like old money aesthetics. And I'm like, well, that's kind of this. Ah, oh, it's, it's indulgent in a way that like, you almost can justify your enjoyment of experiencing their elitism because it's done via a guise of dark academia which then in a way because of how we prize was a pigeon because of how we prize um, morally education knowledge and like reading and a thirst for all of that you basically can ignore a lot of the more problematic financial elitism shit because you're over here moralizing it because of its conjunction to education did that make some kind of sense? I think that made quite a bit of sense. It's like you can enjoy that they're rich 
because you can justify it by going, okay, but they're clever too. But fuck, man, I enjoyed this. I read this so quickly. For me, I read this so quickly. And again, Ta, like Murakami, world builds. And she builds up this beautiful place. It's based on where she actually went. It's called like Hamp, which is, wait, which is the fake one, which is the real one? Is it based on Hampton or is this Hampton? This is absolutely, without a doubt, an absolutely modern classic. It really is. And I'm it just, it's so good. It's so good. I don't know, I think there's a lot of like more like world buildy kind of things that are more escapist, but are really gonna float all of our boats for a long time because none of us want to deal with the world at large right now. None of us do. Well, maybe I do, which is why I'm, which is how I'm gonna dig to talk to you through the next thing that I'm reading because, <laughs> but this was just a joy to read. And there are a lot of conversations to be had about the indulgence of this and elitism. But I think we all want to really enjoy this, so I don't know how much we want to have those conversations. Um, so just think about it. But it's so gripping and it's so entertaining and you can't help but realise how easy it must be to kill another person. And by that I mean physically. How easy it genuinely might just be to kick someone off something and be like, bye bye. Dealing with the aftermath, emotionally, morally, mentally, has to be way harder than actually killing someone. And you can't sit there and be like, huh, because I know you thought about it too. Getting away with it emotionally is harder than getting away with it literally. Much to think about, much to think about. Okay, now I said that escapism is probably gonna be the thing for the next couple of years, um, as well as ludicrous parties, can't wait. Um, I am in fact though reading, I haven't finished this yet, but I've, <laughs> I've read enough of it to talk to you about it. Daniel Defoe's Journal of a Plague Year. It's the plague year. I keep calling it a plague year because we are having our own plague year. Because it's March again. Often I read these ones. If I bought them a while ago, I might still not have read them. So I was like telling myself, you know what, Emma, it's been a while since you read one of these. So I decided to read one of these. So this purports to be an eyewitness account of the London plague in 1665. In 1666, you get the Great Fire of London. You've just had the restoration as well. So that's kind of like, it's 17th century London that we're looking at. I've got a nice map over there of London that you can't see. But you know, it's just focusing on, focusing on then when you said London, you really meant like the city and stuff. And because Defoe is someone who obviously knows London so well and like you're just being guided around and he's talking about like the different streets and like horrible things that are happening on all these different streets. And I'm like, oh, I've been down Drury Lane. Oh, I used to walk down Drury Lane when I'd go over to Chancery Lane, which is where the library for KCL is. Um, and he's talking about the Strand and Fleet Street and stuff. And I'm like, I know that area so well. You have like Somerset House, you have um, Royal Courts of Justice, you go a little bit further back, you've got Gray's Inn and stuff. So it's just interesting, especially because I started reading this when I was still at home before I came back. Um, so it was very comforting for me almost in a way to be guided around a city that I love and know so well. So if you've never been to London, this is an interesting, this is an interesting experience in that sense. But then obviously, I'm so glad I'm reading this now because <laughs> it's making me feel so much better um, about our own plague, about our own pandemic, but also sort of seeing these like similar patterns of behavior. I mentioned it in my like, why, why read, why study literature thing. It's so funny that so much is coming up about like astrologers and like tarot and whatever, because I'm like, as if my entire for you page isn't full of it. It's like, wow, so when things get so big and overwhelming, we turn to things that in essence are big and overwhelming as like almost like an antithesis and both is big and scary, but one of them brings us comfort where one of them is horrifying and terrifying if you think about it too much. So this like predisposition is like there, right? So this is just, it's such an interesting commentary on people because you know, this is set almost 400 years ago. It, written in the 18th century, Defoe loves, Defoe loves a good like, oh, I found a manuscript, <laughs> which then, you know, the romantics, capital R romantics are the one that like really popularise, especially things like Ossian, if you've ever studied that, that's one of those, oh, I found, I found a manuscript. Um, no, you didn't, you wrote it yourself, shut up. So this is more his parents' generation that experienced this rather than Defoe himself. So there's always then that like level of, he still writes for entertainment, do keep that in mind, but then he's more of a pamphleteer and all like, bit of journalism as well, I think. Yeah, a bit of journalism as well. So then he just sort of mixes that together and then it feels so real. It's certainly just interesting to see someone else go through what you are going through 
so far apart in time, but it just sort of speaks to, it kind of speaks to the shared humanity that we all almost desperately need and want at this point. Because we've all been alone for far too long. And I cannot lie, this has made me laugh so many times just because of how morbid it is. Like he's literally explaining how at one point in certain like places they've built like um, plague pits. So they literally would have to dig these huge things to fit all the bodies in and he's giving you all the data. Um, and like I said in my last video, every single, every single time I've had a different statistic from him of how many people have died in a week overall, I end up putting the book down and scrolling, on the, scrolling through the stats that we have about coronavirus on my phone and stuff. It's, I, it, it, it might, some of you, for some of you this might not be the right time to read it. I would encourage you to read it at some point in your lives. Um, just because of how you then start to place things and you're like, there is a level of comfort that you can gather from this, especially because you know that we just have so much more just, as I say sanity, we don't necessarily have more sanity, um, but we certainly have more sanitation. That's what I wanted. And he's also talking about how people just ended up being really fucking miserable and depressed. So it's like, aha, you also had a mental health crisis. That's fine. It's good for that to be acknowledged over time. <laughs> Um, things don't change. It's just interesting seeing how like they dealt with it. If somebody got ill in the house, they would like shut it up. They would get a warden in front of it. You'd have a day and a night warden. Um, they would literally be there painting a massive red cross on your door being like, plague house. You know the Monty Python sketch, which is like, bring out your dead. I thought that was a joke. It's not a joke. They go around with their little death cart, go around with their little death cart and people are brought outside. <laughs> and yeah, he's just talking about this bit where people are genuinely, <laughs> people are literally yeeted from this car into these plague pits. And it's about the fact that this man has gone with the cart because of the fact that lots of his children and his wife are on this cart. And then he thinks they're going to be put gently into this plague pit, but they're kind of like thrown in and then he absolutely has a massive breakdown. Because you would, wouldn't you? Um, it's really funny. <laughs> oh, this is, it's one of those things that if you don't laugh, you will just cry. And like the way the Defoe then also captures this like personal, but also like communal grief is really, I think it's really well, like that is in itself very well done because he talks about how you literally would walk down the streets and you would hear the screams and just like shrieks of just agony not physical, but just that, well, well, yeah, that emotional pain that is so strong, you know, when you feel it physically, you feel that and you know that, and as well, again, because it's so old that you're like, you just, people don't change. And you know, hopefully we don't know, hopefully not in that many of us know it, but that like deep grief. It's a really interesting read either way. Um, and I would not have like got the most out of it had I read it maybe a year ago now at this point, because it is a plague year, but just even a couple years ago, I wouldn't have been, again, enjoyed isn't the right word. I've experienced it the way I have now. It's a slow read, and I've sometimes been managing like 10 pages and then putting it down. It is difficult because it is old, and the one, I guess the one useful thing about being dyslexic is because they haven't updated any of the spelling, so I don't notice that it's wrong. <laughs> So it doesn't mean that it's harder for me to read because I wasn't going to see it anyway. But I do think he can get repetitive and I do think that sometimes it can be a bit convoluted and isn't necessarily structured. It's not like he goes from one thing to another. It's like he does this and then he, when he sort of does this, it's just kind of like building this up. This, so you've got like the section here, he's like building it up by constantly going back and forth instead of just going for it one, 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 one. So in other words, you can kind of get the gist of it pretty quickly. So you really have to like want to get through it because otherwise you just won't. Another plague recommendation I have for you, I guess is Camus the Plague. Uh, my mother recommended it a Cameron, um, which is actually a really, really good suggestion. It's when, they're, when they have the Black Death and they're trying to escape it so they go to a house in the countryside and they pass the time by telling stories. Um, that's the basics of the Decameron, which... I would swear on my life that I have a copy of the Decameron. 
but I never read it because my mum said the translation was bad. So I need to message her what a good translation of the Decameron is. Because when, <laughs> you know what, if I read that, if I read Camus' um, The Plague, maybe I'll give you a video on good plague literature. If you can't laugh about it, you'll cry about it, so... These are the options we have for us today. I have to say, as far as timely, there's never been a better time. <laughs> Who knows, maybe it'll just make you feel better because you're not being yeeted into a plague pit. And lastly, I'm just gonna mention this, I haven't finished reading it yet, Judith Butler's Gen Trouble. I've read about 60 pages and I haven't read more than that because it's really hard. I just wanted to mention this to just say, it's really hard. I'm learning like, one and a half words a page. It's just really difficult and the words are long and I just wish you just give a couple more just clear examples that weren't as convoluted. So I'm just trying like <coughs> my way through it, which then is why when I started reading Daniel Foe's journal of the uh, plague year, um, I ended up reading a completely different book in the meantime. Which I'm not gonna tell you what it is. Um, I'm gonna sneak, I'm gonna stick it on the end of my Goodreads at the end of the year because my mum follows me on Goodreads, so I don't want to mention it. It's given me a headache twice reading it. It requires a lot of concentration and a lot of focus. And this is hard. It's academic. It's hard. But it's also just made me consider a lot about gender already. So... I just need to, like, get on with it. I think I'm gonna finish this, then I'll read something short and enjoyable like a story and then I'll try reading this again because it takes it out of you just mind body soul it takes it out of you it's very dense and complicated but when you get an idea it's that kind of satisfaction right like when you've got an idea it clicks and you're ready like ah oh, of course but this is hard what what bit am I on theorizing the binary the unitary and beyond a lot of notes being made on this um, and it's interesting how much she pulls from Beauvoir's the second sex, which is over there, and um, Monique Wittig, I think, um, and of course Foucault. Of course Foucault! How could you do anything and not mention Foucault? I'm wondering about reading his um, History of Sexuality, but yeah, there we are. That is what I have read this last most recent lockdown. Final lockdown? Can we stop doing this now? We love the UK government response to coronavirus. It's been... <laughs> There we have it. Let me know what you guys have read over lockdown. I start class again really soon, so bear with on the video front. But if there's ever any video requests you have are absolutely welcome. Thank you very, very much for watching. Like, subscribe, and all the jazz. And I will see you guys very, very soon. Bye. <laughs>